going to uh, just remain in worship, and uh, there's just a few things we need to kind of take before the Lord to just pray about, and, and maybe you can pray with your families, or you might, uh, if you just feel led to go uh, uh, pray with somebody around you, that'd be fine. We can do that. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, did, did Dale make it today? No. No. Is he uh, not feeling well? Okay. We need to uh, lift him up. He had a little bit of trouble this week, um, and so we keep lifting uh, Dale Torres up. Um, he's been a faithful servant of the Lord at this place, and um, he's, uh, he still is, uh, but we need to lift him up and, uh, and just encourage his Encourage him and pray that the Lord might encourage his heart as well. Heal him as he uh, recovers. Uh, Olga's home, but uh, she's uh, doing better. Uh, Wayne, you know, he had some issues, but uh, he seems like uh, he's kind of... With Wayne, you never really know. You don't really know if you're getting the full story or not, you know what I mean? Uh, he says he's doing well. Uh, so that means he's just, you know, on this side of, you know eternity. But um, uh, anyway, we need to lift them up and just uh, continue to pray for them. I, I appreciate, Dee, that you uh, brought up the churches that are struggling right now. We've got some churches that are under the gun, uh, some that have decided to move inside and have regular church service, and I'm not against that. I, I, I think this thing has kind of turned into a persecution of sorts, and um, I'm it's something I'm really kind of looking at and really trying to be uh, wise about and, and what we do as we move forward. But um, uh, we have some churches that have decided to, uh, uh, to meet and just to be a part of what God has called us to do, and that is to meet together. And so uh, uh, there's some pastors that are kind of under the gun, uh, some that have been uh, maybe uh, told they're going to be fined or put in jail. Um, that would be the good one. I, that, I'd like to see them be put in jail because then, you know, they could sing at midnight and, and, you know, have the thing crush and, you know, have a guy come in and say, what must I do to be saved? I mean, that, that would be great. So uh, uh, we, we need to be praying for them and lift them up as well, our, our brothers and sisters who are uh, under, under that persecution. Also, we have been praying for those uh, opportunities we've had to share the gospel. Many of you have had great opportunity to share the gospel during this time. Um, I, I think that needs to continue. What do you guys say? Now that you're in the habit of it, you know, because it's kind of just rolls out of your, you know, you ask somebody. I saw on a Frito bag the other day, it said, um, uh, show some kindness, ask somebody about their day. On a Frito bag. I mean, what is that doing on a Frito bag? Now, I know you're asking the question, what are you doing with Fritos? I didn't say where I saw it. It could have been at a store. You don't know. But I saw it on a bag, and I thought, wow, maybe we ought to start doing that. Just put little signs out there. Be kind to somebody. Share the gospel. Uh, ask them about their day, but then let that roll into, hey, let me tell you about my day and why it's so great. Amen? Uh, but then you have to have a great day, and you have to have joy while you're doing that. You can't be going, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. He loves you. He died for you, and you can have salvation. No, 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 you got you to gotta be joyful about it, you know? You gotta, man, it's a hope that we have in him. And so we need to be praying for uh, the opportunities that we have and for those that we've shared the gospel with, uh, that the gospel might take seed and plant as it gets planted and that God might do a work to uh, bring those people to himself. Amen? So you guys can kind of mingle around, pray a little bit. Um, we won't have folks in front like we uh, typically do, but... Um, because there's no shade, that's all it is, <laughs> and I'm hot. So um, anyway, we uh, let's pray and, and worship. We're going to have children's church, yes? Where are they? Are they going? Miss Lisa's going to take them? That's your, uh, that's your daughter there, uh, Nick. She's taking the kids to teach them something. All right, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we will, uh, we will worship the Lord. Thank you, Father, oh, for your goodness, for your love. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Who, God in flesh, came to this earth, took on the sin of all of us who would believe in him, died and paid the penalty of that sin. Father, thank you that our, uh, that our salvation is not based on our merit. Thank you that it's not based on our goodness. But Father, we can just look to your son and know that that's our hope. It was his sacrifice that paid the price. 
And we just simply come in belief and repentance that his salvation is full and free given to us. Oh, Father, thank you for that truth. And now we pray that you might bless this time as we worship you and we just stand in your presence singing your praise, delighting in who you are. Father, may it not just be uh, something we do uh, because it's called for. Father, may it be something we do from true worship of our hearts. And we give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. So bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship your holy name. Your rich in love. You're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I will worship Your holy name. Day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. So bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Seem like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship Your holy name. I will worship Your holy name. Jesus, I will worship Your holy name. You are my strength when I am weak. 
You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, you're the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I'll bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, you're the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, you're the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, you're the Lamb. Of God, worthy is your name, Jesus. You're the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Amen. First Kings chapter 8, 22, Solomon says, he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. And he said, Lord, God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or the earth below like you who keeps your covenant and mercy with your servant who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept what you promised your servant, David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hands as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised, your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fall, fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel, only if your son takes heed to their way that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, Let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. We come into your presence, pass the gates of praise, into your sanctuary. Till we're standing face to face I look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace And I can only bow down And say You're awesome in this place My God You are awesome in this place Of a Father you are worthy of all praise to you our lives we raise you are awesome in this place mighty God come into your presence past the gates of praise into your sanctuary till we're standing face to face Look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace I can only bow down And say You are awesome in this place Mighty God You are awesome in this place Of 
the Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Father. of all praise to you our lives we raise you are awesome in this place mighty God you are awesome in this place mighty God you are awesome in this place mighty God praise God delight in the praise of your people. And Father, we come to you today humbly. And we come today knowing that <laughs> our salvation isn't because of anything we've done, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ, the faithful servant. And so we give you great honor and praise and glory. Be magnified today. Thank you that we get to stand in your presence. Thank you that we get to worship at your feet. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. This morning, sure. This morning we have a, uh, another treat for you. And that is, I, I have a new neighbor. Um, <laughs> I, I have a new neighbor who happens to be my, my son-in-law and my daughter, and, um, and he also gave me my, uh, a grandson recently, which I'm anticipating maybe another one in the next few moments here. Well, how's things working over here? <laughs> okay. So, uh, I, you know, both my son-in-laws, my son was able, to, uh, as you know, able to give me a couple of sons, a men child, but he's a stoppy. Um, my implants, of course, they, they've been a little bit slower at uh, giving me an actual grandson, uh, but I did get one from, uh, from Stev, and so uh, it, to celebrate that great and glorious task and, uh, and, and uh, completion of task, uh, I uh, asked Stev to come and bring the message uh, for us today. So, Stevan, um, I, I, I know you guys love him. He has been faithful in... Uh, uh, we're really taking over our college and career uh, since uh, Dale and Amy have been kind of slowing down a little bit, and Dale's been uh, hurt and wounded in action, and, and uh, Steb and Kayla have stepped up and done a great, uh, phenomenal job working with our, our young people of that age group, and I'm so thankful for them, and um, I, I know you are too. So, Steven, are you ready? You come and bring us the word, my friend. Yeah, with the road. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Still not? Still not? Okay. Good morning. There we go. We'll use this. Yeah. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Uh, as my new neighbor, uh, a.k.a. father-in-law, uh, said, my name is Stev. We do have a new son. We're so excited for him. Thank you so much for your prayers and... Uh, and the meals. Uh, that was a, a huge praise for us, and we're very, very grateful for each of you uh, contributing in that manner, so thank you. I love this church. I love each of you, and uh, I'm so grateful uh, for all of you, so uh, let's, let's get in God's Word. Is it a good day to get in God's Word today? 
Let's do it. Let's open up our books to Mark. We've been studying Ephesians chapter 6 at college and career, and it's been, uh, it's been good. I, I really enjoy it, and it's just so relevant to today, especially with all the trials that are going on, uh, knowing about the full armor of God. Uh, but there's something to be said here about this story and Mark that I wanted to discuss today and, and bring to you. And this is a elementary teaching. This is, if you were to title it, what is hindering you? What is hindering you? What does hindrance mean? Something holding you back. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Let's go to verse 17. Read with me, please. I'm reading from ESV. And this is a story about a young man, a young man who was a shallow seeker. And, well, let's just read. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says this. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, <clears throat> excuse me, and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Verse 20. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept for my youth. Some of your versions say, for my youth and up. And Jesus looked at him, loved him. And said, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, listen, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We are so grateful for your word, your lessons in teaching us, Father, for those that recorded, and Father, for your spirit, writing through these men the very words of you. So, Lord, we pray, Father, for today. We pray that you would bless this morning, that we would uh, just be encouraged by your word. Father, that we would look into our own hearts and look to see if there's any hindrance that we could lay before you. So, Father, we love you. We ask that your spirit would teach us, that would guide us, and help us remember the things of you. In Jesus' name, amen. The rich young ruler who knew it all. What an amazing story. This is a story about a young man who was seeking after eternal life, which is a good thing to seek after. Um, it's a good thing to wonder about. You know, what happens after we die? Do you know? Does the world know? Why are we here? These are all questions. This is a question about salvation here. Salvation. And here we have a young man that completely misses it. We have a young man who, who looks at what's being said 
and goes away sorrowful at the cost. So what's the cost? Let's take a look. First of all, let's go back to verse 17 in Mark chapter 10. The one, my, my heading says the rich young man. Does yours say the rich young ruler in your Bible? Young, rich young man, a couple of you say the rich young ruler. Uh, it says this, as he was setting out on a journey, Jesus, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to in- inherit eternal life? So here we have Jesus. I'm going to set up the scene for you. He was leaving, going on a uh, journey, and a, a man ran up to Jesus, and he knelt down before him. I want you to imagine this. He knelt down before Jesus, and he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life, the inherit, uh, the eternal life that you've been discussing, the one that we've been hearing about, the one that you've been discussing on the roads and people have been gathering in thousands to hear? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I want you to think about this question for a moment. And I want you to think about the young man that's asking it. Here we have a rich young man. A rich young man. First of all, we know that he's, he's rich. It's kind of nice to have that cush life where you don't have to worry about working in the fields. You pay someone to work for you. That's very, very nice. Um, this man is young. And if you have a young with rich you can kind of see what, you kind of mold the character here of just like put him in a profile here. We have a young rich man, and then we also have that he's a ruler. He has authority where he has a cloud of leadership where he is ruling over people. So he's a young man that is wealthy and that rule has a power essentially. You can kind of see that this man was successful in his choices. Maybe he was born into it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Um, I don't know. I just had to. I'm sorry. Uh, he, was, he was rich, he was young, and he had power. And we can kind of see that when you're young and when you have power and you have all the expenses, we see this today in our society. We know what this looks like. We have people that go crazy, uh, buying things that are frivolous. Uh, Maybe this man wasn't, but we can kind of see that there's this little bit of uh, immaturity that comes with being young and in a position of power. And there's also a little bit of of pride. Would you guys agree? There There could be a gateway to pride here, where a young man would see, hey, I've done all this stuff at a young age. I'm good. There's people that are older than me and I haven't even accomplished what I've accomplished. There's that level of elevation in his mind. And you could tell that he was in a position of stature. The the people knew in the community that he was rich and he was a young ruler. This is a catalyst for worldly success, yes, and even desire by the world, but it's a warning sign for sin. It's a warning sign, a red flag for potential pitfalls and and sin that is going to separate you from the love of God. Even if you're in the church, folks, even if you're in a righteous community. So let's take a look. Let's go on further. We kind of got an idea of who he is. Good. All right. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He asked this question. Basically, like, I already have everything else. I got it all. What must I do to inherit this eternal life? I want this. You've been talking about it, and I want it. How do I do it? I already got everything else. I already know how to achieve everything else. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? You guys notice that? He's had this track record of doing, and I get it. I've been a technician for the past eight years, working on 10 now. Uh, doing in the technical field, and when something's broken, I'm always like, hey, so, you know, wh- when did it start happening? And I start analyzing it. Well, when, when, when did it first occur? Can you think of anything that caused, did you do anything different around the time that the issue, the issue occurred? Oh, oh, you put in a new X or Y, oh, okay. 
Did you, and we start trying to fix things. We try, start trying to do things in order to, to find the desired outcome. And I could see, I could relate to this young man because I'm a really young man. You know, you know I'm coming to the age where I have four kids uh, and I'm not in my 20s anymore. And it, and it shows and, it, and I feel it. Uh, but praise the Lord. Amen. Um, oh, don't even over here. Stevie and Daryl are like, Look it, listen, my 20-year-old friends will laugh at me because I'm breaking everything, like I'm spraining things, and I can't, it's just, I'm fragile. So, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, we have, uh, we have this young man that is in a record of like trying to fix things, trying to do things for himself at this young age. He's been doing that his whole life. There's a reason why he's successful. There's a reason why he is a ruler, he is worthy of it at this point, and he, he's been doing it, and he's successful. So he says, what can I do to inherit this? What can I do to attain this? And the very question itself puts no emphasis on God and puts emphasis on his own accomplishments. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Did you hear that? Instead of putting emphasis on God and what he's capable of doing, this young man says, what can I I do? What must I do to be saved, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him this, knowing his heart, Jesus is omniscient. He knows and sees this young man's potentially prideful heart and the fact that he knows it all. And he says this, why, why do you call me good? You should know this. Why do, you, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This is a little... I, I could see through you. You're kneeling down before me, not because you think I'm God, but because you just want eternal life. You want the easy way. You want to know how to do this one little thing and be good. Well, look at what Jesus says. Verse 19, he says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Defraud, by the way, is the only reference that's very unique to this book in Mark uh, versus other gospels. Defraud, we could, some scholars say that it's coveting, uh, but defraud is used here in Mark only. But he says, look at all these things, the Ten Commandments. Do these things. Do these things. And these are hard things to do, folks. You might look at murder and be like, eh, we can get that one done. But look what Jesus says, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. He takes it a step further and goes at the heart. Again, it's about the heart here, folks. Do not commit adultery. Oh, well, I'm young. I'm not married. I'm good. Do not steal. Oh, I'm rich. I don't need to do that. Do not bear false witness. Oh, why do I need to do that? I'm in a position of authority. Do not defraud. Uh, I don't need to covet anything. I got it all. I have it all. Honor your father and mother. Pfft, easy. And what does he say? And he said to him, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. All these I've kept from my youth. Think about this response. It's loaded. All these I've kept from my youth. He's basically saying, I know that already. I know all that. The, your commandments that are so holy, I know that already. And I've done them since I was very, very young, all the way up. Have you seen my track record? Have you noticed how successful I am? Have you not observed my life? And you want to tell me to do these elementary things? Come on, Jesus. Give me something with meat here. Yeah, I asked you how to attain eternal life, and you gave me this Sunday school answer. Come on, I know all this already. You see the pride that comes here? The pride that comes in this response. All these I've done since my youth, I'm good. Give me a break. I need something harder to do. Hashtag I am blameless. Uh, don't use that hashtag, folks. Um, 
yeah, especially in this instance. But this man was looking for salvation. And he, this, is a, this is a man who's looking and, and viewing God's precepts as salvation, excuse me, faith plus works equals salvation. Did you hear that? Faith and my works will only equal salvation. I will only be saved if I have faith and if I do these good things, then I will be saved. Is that what Jesus teaches? Does Jesus teach that if you believe and if you do all the good works, then, then you will be redeemed, you will be saved, you'll be sanctified, you'll have salvation. Folks, that's what a lot of people believe. I have to do something in order to be saved. Well, guess what? Jesus says, by your faith, your salvation will accompany works. Because of your faith in God, because of your faith in the Son, because of your faith in who I am and what I've said, your salvation will be with will be accompanied with your works. That's why it says in James. Let's take a look at James 2, 14. Where is James at in my Bible? What page? 316? You got a tiny Bible, man. James. I should have put this down here. James 2, chapter 14. I'm going to go up a little bit. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without having given them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Did you hear that? Verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You see, God is saying, your faith is salvation accompanied by works. Your faith, when you have faith in God, you will have salvation, and that faith produces works. It's not your works produces salvation, like this rich young ruler was thinking. What must I do, Lord? He's bounding down before God. He's like, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do? Well, folks, there's nothing you can do. That's why he says later on, I know we're skipping ahead, He's saying, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. What an amazing, stress-relieving truth. Amen? There's nothing that you can do. Your righteousness are filthy rags. And we have people today praying, praying to the saints, praying to, to Mary. Lord, uh, or excuse me, I don't want to talk to Jesus because if I'm talking to Jesus, it's a, you're in a bad spot, but I'm going to ask Mary to, to talk with Jesus for me. I'm going to ask Mary, I'm going to ask this saint to, to intercede on my behalf. Well, folks, Jesus is saying that work is finished on the cross. It's not about your works that gets you saved. It's your faith in the Son. We have a lot of people knocking on doors saying, if I don't hit this quota, I will not be entered into the kingdom. If I don't do X or Y or Z, I cannot be saved. If I, oh, if I failed this week and I was sick, I had the coronavirus, and I can't knock on doors, or I can't say this thing to this person, oh, well, I'm, I'm now meddling with my salvation. Folks, that's a wrong way to look at it. And that's the way that this rich young ruler was looking at it. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I've done all these things already. What else must I do? Let's take a look at what he says. Oh, I'm still in James. That's why. I'm like, what? Mark chapter 10. He says, verse 21, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, Listen, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. 
You know that success that you had? You know all that stuff that you've accumulated at such a young age? You're a wonderkind, by the way. I want you to get rid of it. All the, all the successes, all the accolades, all the things that you've done, destroy it. Get rid of it. In fact, give it to the poor. The, give it to the undeserving that didn't work for anything. They just, just give it to the poor. Give it to the unwealthy. You think that would be hard to do? I mean, realistically, if you were told to sell all your things, to follow after him, and Jesus isn't preaching here that poverty is a prerequisite to salvation. That's not what's being said. What is a prerequisite to your salvation is forsaking all to follow after Christ. That's the prerequisite. You can't hold anything back. There is no, oh, I want to follow after Jesus, but I still want to hold on to my sin. I don't want to give this up. That's what this rich young ruler was doing. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And this rich young ruler was looking around at all of his stuff. He probably had these gold rings on, and he was like, I'm good. And Jesus says, get rid of all the things that think that you're good. Get rid of it all. Follow after me. What was his response? Verse 22. What was his response? He said, disheartened by the will, excuse me, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He went away with his head down low. He had a lot of possessions. He went away sad, sorrowful. And some people, some scholars say, this young man, this rich young ruler was saved. Because Jesus looked at him with love. And Jesus doesn't look on anybody with love except those whom he loves. And so this sorrowful that he's experiencing is a repentance sorrowful, a sorrow that leads to repentance. That's fine. Okay. We can talk about that. Some say that he was not saved. Some say that he, the mere question of why he asked, how must I attain eternal life, shows his heart. And that the love that Jesus was discussing here it was a love and of compassion. He like the way that he pray, he weeps over Israel. That's okay. Regardless, any way you cut it, Jesus requires your whole heart. Jesus requires your heart, mind, soul, and strength to follow after him. This isn't some part-time gig. This isn't something where you go, you know what, every Sunday I'll show up. And I'll wear my nice button-up shirt with pearl snaps and a lion sticker from Everly who put it here. Uh, it's not about that. It's not about what you wear. It's not about what you read. It's not about what you know. It's not about the fact that you went to school, a Bible school, for eight years, ten years. It doesn't matter. Jesus requires your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. You get that. Do you understand that? Jesus wants to know you intimately. And sin, that's the thing that separates you. That's the thing that separates you from the love of Christ. And if you're without forgiveness, if you're without reconciliation, then you have no part in him. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at Psalm 107.15. We could see uh, the very power of God. He says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Jesus, God, is able to cut through the slavery of sin and watch as those chains melt off and, if you, and you follow after Christ. For those of us that are believers in here but are stained with sin, that can't get rid of sin, that made no attempt. Listen, here's a quote. It says, sin demands to have a man by himself. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him, and the more deeply he becomes involved in it the more disastrous in his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light 
in the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. This can happen even in the midst of a pious community. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of the heart. The sin must be brought into the light. The unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged. All that is secret and hidden is made manifest. It is a hard struggle until the sin is openly admitted. But God, but God, breaks the gates of brass and bars of iron. That's a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And it's an incredible quote. Because sin does isolate. It tells you, you can't tell anybody. It tells you, you need to be quiet about this. You can't do this. Isolate yourself. Folks, there's nothing farther from the truth. There's nothing farther from the truth. And that's where we come to 2 Corinthians 5.20. You see, there's a way out of sin, and that is Jesus. There's a way to divert God's wrath and justice, and that is through Jesus. You see, God is a just God. He is a judge, and he's a righteous judge. He's not going to go, you know what, your sin, you've been a good guy. You showed up to church every Sunday. That's cool. You rode in an ambulance or fire truck. Is that a fire? I can never tell the sirens apart. Ah, fire truck. Oh, yeah. But Jesus, uh, but God is a just God. He doesn't just sit there and go, you know what? I'm not going to judge today. No. God is a just God. There will be justice handed down. And if you're sitting here today without any reconciliation of who God is, or if you don't know who Christ is and don't follow after him, and you might even say, I know him, I'm here, right? You just told me about him. You just told me a little bit about who he is. I know that God exists. Well, guess what, folks? James tells us even the demons believe God exists and they shudder. They shudder at the very knowledge of his judgment and his power. So you might say, oh, I know God. I know him. We're cool. I'm cool with the man upstairs. Folks, that's buying into a lie. Buying into a lie. Second Corinthians says this, God made him, uh, it says Second Corinthians 5.20, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Folks, this is the doctrine of substitution. This is the doctrine of substitution. God is just. There will be a sentence that is carried out but what God does is he looks at Jesus and he says, this is the substitutionary atonement for your sins. He looks at Jesus and he treats him the way, if, as if he had all the weight of every single sin of every believer. And he puts that sin on Christ and he judges him for it. And that's why he says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who had no sin which is Jesus, even though he was sinless, he was a sinless, perfect, sacrificial lamb. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that a praise? Because if you're standing before the judge and you go, you know what, judge, I've been all right. I tried my best. And he's gonna go, do you remember that time that you said this thing, that you thought this thing? Remember this time that you did this, you stole, you lied? Remember those things? Those are all sins against me. What say you? Well, I was, I was okay. I tried my best. You think a judge at the courthouse in Stanislaus County is going to go, you know what? You did your best throughout your life. Yeah, you, uh, you killed someone. Because you've been a good guy, I'm going to let you walk. You think that will happen? No, no good judge would ever let that occur. No good judge would ever judge justly 
He wouldn't be a judge. He would be a, yeah, whatever. Be a poor, poor judge. God is a perfect judge. And when Jesus comes in the picture, he lays out the full wrath, unheld back, unrestrained on Christ for all the sin of every believer ever. He puts it on Christ. And so when you stand on judgment day in a condemned state and you go, Jesus, I've done all these things. And he goes, what say you? I'm not sure if he says that or not. He's going to say nothing. I have nothing. And it is through Christ alone. It is through Christ alone who does and takes that penalty for you. So folks, if you're in this audience today, and this is the first time that you've heard of this, know more about it. There's a God who loves you. He's loved you so much that he sent his only son to die for you that whoever believes in him shall never die, but have everlasting life in him. So what must you do to inherit eternal life? Let's take a look. Let's go back. Well, let's, well, might as well. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. It says this. It says in verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's faith in that. There's faith in your heart confession with your mouth that he is raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's a praise. And it's not just some little checkbox. This is true saving faith, folks. This is something that you need to believe in your heart, enough so that you speak with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. You see the progression? Believe in your heart and the works will follow. Not the works and then you believe in your heart. It's not backwards. Let's go back to Mark before we go too off topic here. What chapter are we in, Cody? Mark 10. Thank you. What are we doing on time? Oh, my goodness. Verse 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Do you go away sorrowful? We just told him what he needs to do. He says, get rid of the things that you love most. Get rid of the things that are hindering you most in this life. You want to follow after me? Yet you're trusting in this world. What good is it if a man gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? That's Mark 8. What good is it? Now or later, the famous candy with substantial meaning uh, in its name. Now or later, now or later. This young man is focused on the now. Are you focused on the now? It's hard not to be, amen? I got a growing family. Uh, This is something that I'm constantly having to check my heart on and in repentance to God, because I love my family, folks. And it is probably, I'll safely say, this is one of the biggest idols in my life is my family. Something that I put before God oftentimes, and I go, oh, Lord, please forgive me. I'm elevating things of this world more than my fam- more than God. My family is being elevated higher. This world is being elevated higher. The, my success my fortune, my stature in the community is being elevated higher than following wholeheartedly after Jesus. What is hindering you? You see, what's hindered this young man was his accolades, was his ability, was his power to do things because he was a wonderkind. He was young, he was able, and he knocked out of the park probably everything that he touched. So why is it abnormal for him to think, why can I figure out how to do this, and I'll be good in the life to come. I'll have all my bases rounded. Verse 23, and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be, it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Why, were he, why was he amazed at that? 
Back in those times, wealth was a sure track to salvation. It was thought to be a sure track to attaining salvation. And we see a rich young ruler, people thought, oh, he's good. And this young man thought he was good. But Jesus dispels that myth. He says how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom. Why? Distraction. Distraction. Idol worship in form of personal gain, in form of riches, accolades, track records. This is America, folks. You talk to a man on the street, what do you do for a living? Who, you know, what, what's going on? Oh, hey, my name's Steb. What's your name? My name is Ken Lightsey. Okay, well, what do you do? We have these things called, this, this social network called LinkedIn. Have you heard of LinkedIn? And we have people on there instead of saying like, this is who I am, this is about, no, it's like all about business. And it's like, senior vice president of, this it's like da, 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 and you try to mock yourself up as this like we call it in college career we call it flexing flexing on everybody and it's true you try to flex but jesus isn't concerned about your flex he's concerned about your heart and what you're following after what are you following after for this young man it was just things and he said go sell your things Get rid of the things. Get rid of the thing that's holding you back. Have you examined your life? What's holding you back? What's holding you back from serving? What's holding you back from entering into the presence and reconciliation of a God who intercedes on your behalf on judgment day? What's holding you back? Is it things? Is it family? Now and later. Is it worth now versus later? Because if you stand before the judge, and if you don't have re reconciliation, if you don't have atonement for your sins, you will be cast into eternal damnation, into judgment, into the hellfire. Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Go from me, you wicked son of evil. Well, but I did these things. I, I, I casted out demons in your name. I, I preached. I went to church on Sunday. Depart from me. I never knew you. The gospel is this, that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might attain the righteousness of God. Folks, it's very simple. It's very simple. And yet it's so difficult for we walk away sorrowful because we don't want to give up our worldly gain. What's holding you back? What's holding you back? So as you consider these things, as you consider this message in Mark, there's things I want to reflect on. What could the rich young ruler have done differently? What could the rich young ruler have done differently? differently. And what do you think your response would be if Jesus told you to get rid of the idol that you've been worshiping your entire life? Put yourself in this young man's shoes. What would you do? What are you doing now when God says, give up these things? What are you doing now? And I want you guys to examine your life for a moment. What do you need to do today in order to obey Christ's command to follow him without hindrance? What do you need to do today? What do you need to cut? What do you need to limit? What do you need to start doing in order to follow Christ, without hindrance, full-heartedly, with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. Philippians 4 tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And it is true. Christ will strengthen you. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your amazing, wondrous work on the cross, for your grace, your mercy that abounds. Father, for, for dying for mankind, for sending your son as the substitutionary person to die for us. Father, your, your word says that you intercede for us on judgment day. Lord, I pray for the man that's here. I pray for the woman. I pray for the boy, the, the daughter, for the son, the whoever. I pray for those that are listening in their houses to these words of you. Father, that you, your spirit would do a work in their life to follow after you wholeheartedly without hindrance. God, give us the strength to say no to ungodliness and follow after you with all that we have so that we may love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, that we may finish the race strong, that we may look at our life for what it is, that it is solely 100% to bring about you glory in all that we do. So, Father, I pray that you would soften the heart, that you would turn that heart of stone into heart of flesh, that we would want to seek after you, and that we would call on your son. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Squeaky. Thank you, Stevan. I'm uh, so appreciative of that. That that wasn't Ephesians 6, but that was uh, impactful, so thank you. It's, um, it's amazing to know that sometimes we go to the right source, like this man did. He went to Jesus. He just didn't. He just didn't humble himself to, uh, to like Christ answered. Man, how important it is. So thank you, Stephen, for bringing that, reminding us of that, forsaking all and following Christ. And that's the saddest part of the story is he left sad when he should have stayed and followed. Let's stand together. Father, we do give you praise and glory today for this opportunity we have to be in this place, to worship you, to hear from your word. Uh, Father, may your word do the work that it's intended to do. Uh, your word never returns void. And so we thank you for that word this morning. We pray that you might bless this, this church. We pray that you might bless these people as they go from this place this week. May they be a light in a dark world, may they uh, perpetuate the gospel of Jesus Christ, and may they share with their neighbors and friends the hope that we have in him. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.